Radix economy is usually said to be one of the ways that we measure what makes a number base good, but the reality is not quite that simple. In this video, I want to talk about what Radix economy is specifically, and more importantly, what it is and isn't used for. Radix economy is something you'll hear about when people are talking about different number systems with different bases and trying to determine which one is the best. But more precisely, Radix economy is a measure of what base is most efficient in a certain specific way at writing numbers. Many people say this means it's a measure of the best number base, although I don't think this is true because there are other considerations than just efficiency, like ease of use. In fact, I was originally going to do a whole thing about what is the best base for a number system, but I decided to back up and do Radix economy first for two reasons. One, the best base turns out to be a much harder question than I bargained for. I couldn't find a straightforward way to quantify my intuitions about what makes a base easy to use. And two, I realized there really wasn't a good video explanation on YouTube about Radix economy yet, so it just made more sense to start there. So let's get to it. To start off, let's look at the definition of Radix economy. It's a little complicated, but if we go through it step by step, we can simplify it. The Radix economy for a given number n in base b is defined as the number of digits it takes to write n in base b multiplied by the base b itself. In this case, smaller is better. So in base 10, 123 has a Radix economy of 30. 2022 has a radix economy of 40. A million has a radix economy of 70. Defined this way, radix economy isn't a single number. It varies with the numbers we plug into it. In fact, it's not even a smooth function. It jumps up every time we add another digit. Here's what it looks like on a log scale. This seems a bit too specific to be directly useful if it's going to be different for every number we plug in. But since we're only comparing bases, we don't need to worry about what number we're writing as long as it's the same number. We can just plug in the same number n for every base, say a million, and then we can plot the radix economy as a function of the base. But this still looks choppy because it still jumps when the number of digits changes. Like when we go from base 10, which takes seven digits to write a million, to base 11, which takes six digits. We can do better than this. It's kind of hard to tell from the graphs, but those jumps when we add a digit for larger numbers get relatively smaller and smaller the more digits we have. So we can take a limit as n approaches infinity, and we should get a smooth function. That limit looks like this. Now this isn't quite right because I'm still plotting it for n equals 1 million. This just gives you an idea of where it's going if we did use a larger n. But since n is arbitrary, we can divide out the log of n to get a measure that only depends on the base. That's still fine as long as we use the same arbitrarily large number for every base. This is what we get when we divide out log n. This statistic doesn't seem to have an official name, so I'll call it the normalized Radix economy. If it does have a name, let me know in the comments, but I couldn't find anything. This measure seems much more intuitive. It's essentially a relative measure of how efficient each base is at writing large numbers on average. The next obvious question is, which base has the best Radix economy? Well, I said smaller is better, and if we look at the graph of the normalized Radix economy, we see that it has a minimum at b equals e. So the most efficient base is e, or approximately 2.718. Bases can be any number. But it's a lot more convenient if they're integers, so the best radix economy for an integer base is base 3. But that seems kind of strange. Base 3 is the most efficient base? It sure doesn't look like it. In base 3, a million has to be written like this. That's a lot of digits. But radix economy isn't actually about the number of digits. If all we cared about was the number of digits, it would be 1 over log b. But the actual formula we found was b over log b. 
Again, the formula involves multiplying by the base. And that was the question I had going into this video. Why do we multiply by the base? It seems to me that the most efficient base is one that writes numbers with the fewest digits. And if we do that, the larger base is always going to win out. It won't be as easy to use, but it will be the most efficient. But instead, we multiply by b, which favors smaller bases that take a lot of digits to write. Why would we do that? Well, it's like I said at the start of the video. It turns out the radix economy is defined like it is because it's measuring efficiency in a very specific way. Imagine that you're an engineer living in 1945. The United States Army is trying to build the world's first fully electronic, fully programmable computer, the ENIAC. You have been tasked with designing the module that stores numbers for addition and subtraction operations. The transistor hasn't been invented yet, so you have to use vacuum tubes. And vacuum tubes are expensive and unreliable, so you want to use as few of them as possible. How do you do it? If you know a thing or two about computer science today, you're probably saying something about encoding into binary and building a carry adder. But hold your horses. This is 1945. Binary computing has been played with a bit, but it's certainly not well developed yet. And it's certainly not clear that it's the best way to do things. In fact, it might not be. To build a binary computer, you have to convert human readable decimal numbers into binary at the input, and then convert the binary back to decimal at the output. And that also takes vacuum tubes. Maybe the higher-ups want you to keep it simple, or maybe you just think decimal is better, but you need to store the numbers in decimal. So what do you do? You could store each digit with a single vacuum tube with 10 different voltage levels. That would certainly save on tubes. But remember, vacuum tubes are unreliable. You can't really trust them to have accurate voltage levels other than on and off. Again, that was just binary encoding, but we already decided against that. So now what? You could use binary coded decimal. Binary coded decimal is still decimal, but each digit is recorded as its binary representation, requiring four bits. And that might be okay for storing numbers. But for adding numbers, it gets complicated pretty fast. You need a carry adder within each digit and another adder across the digits, and that means more vacuum tubes. The simplest system conceptually, the easiest for humans to understand, and possibly the most efficient at this early stage, is to have a bank of 10 vacuum tubes for each digit, numbered 0 through 9, and to turn on the vacuum tube corresponding to that digit. Essentially, an electronic abacus. And that is exactly what the army did for ENIAC. ENIAC recorded 10-digit decimal numbers with devices called ring counters, which stored each digit on a bank of 10 vacuum tubes. But that takes a lot of vacuum tubes, because base 10 numbers require rather large ring counters. In fact, the number of vacuum tubes we need is the number of digits multiplied by the base, which is exactly the radix economy. ENIAC used 10-digit decimal numbers, so it could write numbers up to 10 billion minus 1 and it had a radix economy of 100 for 100 vacuum tubes. But moving away from ENIAC specifically, we don't have to use base 10, do we? You can build a ring counter of any size. What if we use base 6, for example? Writing 10 billion minus 1 in base 6 requires 13 digits, but the 40% smaller ring counters more than make up for it. In base 6, it only takes 78 vacuum tubes. In base 4, it takes 68 vacuum tubes. In base 2, it also takes 68 vacuum tubes. And in base 3, we only need 63 vacuum tubes to write 10 billion minus 1. Base 3 really is the most efficient. That's why radix economy is important. Except, you may be thinking, couldn't we just encode in binary directly? Excellent question. Yes, we could. 
If you encode that number in binary directly, you only need 34 vacuum tubes for 34 bits. The only problem is that's a completely different architecture. It doesn't use B vacuum tubes per bit in base B. More to the point, it's an architecture that hadn't really been developed yet when ENIAC was built. ENIAC didn't even take advantage of Radix economy in the first place. It still used base 10, presumably because it was simpler and didn't require base conversions, but also because the Radix economy solution to the problem wasn't published until 1950. And anyway, decimal computers in general persisted into the 60s, so people must have still thought they were useful. Electronic computers aren't the only place that Radix economy pops up either. Storing numbers on punch cards, for example, which punch one of ten spots for each digit, has the same trade-offs. But does that mean base 3 is really the best base? No. It's the most efficient base to use for vacuum tube machines like ENIAC, but even then it's only if you use this particular encoding system. It's certainly not how we work with numbers with pencil and paper. That's exactly why we use hexadecimal. And it's not even the most efficient base for building computers generally because you can save more vacuum tubes by encoding in binary directly. The question is, why is this different? We just showed that base 3 is the most efficient for a ring counter system, but that's not the only way to encode numbers. For example, instead of having one bulb to mark a zero, you could just represent zero as having all the bulbs turned off. That's how it's done on an actual abacus. Zero is represented by zero beads, not one. Now, this sounds like it might not be a good idea with those unreliable vacuum tubes. How do you know this is really a zero and not just the five tube being burnt out? But as before, using fewer vacuum tubes is worth that trouble. And the best way to do that turns out to be binary encoding. Because instead of two bulbs for zero and one, each digit is represented by just one bulb with on for one and zero for off. This is a big advantage because it cuts the number of vacuum tubes in half from base two and nearly in half from our previous calculation for base three. That happens because the Radix economy formula doesn't apply anymore. The grid needs one less vacuum tube than the base for each digit, which gives us a different formula. And if we go through the same steps as before to compute our normalized Radix economy, we get b minus 1 over log b instead of b over log b. If we calculate this new figure for each base, where ternary was the most efficient before, binary now wins by a significant margin. In other words, Radix economy is good at what it does, but it's not the right tool for the job here. Which base is best depends on the context of what you're using it for. Base 3 is best only for ring counters and punch cards. Base 2 is best for computers based on logic gates. And both of them are terrible if we're talking about natural language. When people say, wouldn't math be easier if we used base 12 or base 6, they're actually talking about how numbers are used in natural language things like names for numbers and doing math in your head or on paper. No one's going to want to use a base where a number as small as 100 takes 5 or even 7 digits to write. And for base 3, no one's going to want to use a base that can't write halves gracefully either. This isn't a contradiction because Radix economy is a tool that wasn't intended for natural language. It made sense for early computers, but it's a mistake to apply it outside that context. What the best base is for natural language, though, that's a topic for another video.